Being an astronaut was not something that I thought I could ever do. I was such a bad student, it was not something that I ever considered as a real possibility. What were some of the characteristic qualities you see that's common amongst the people that become astronauts? You know, just because you might be the best physicist in the world doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be the best astronaut. You know, it's a privilege to be able to fly in space. So let me tell you who I'm sitting next to today. I'm sitting next to a man who one day woke up and said, you know, it'd be kind of cool if I went and lived in space for 340 days. I don't know. Let's try traveling about 240 million miles, 240 again, a million miles, which is about a quarter of a billion miles and go see what's out there in space. I don't know what's out there in space. And while he was doing that, Time Magazine was doing a whole series of videos with him on what the experience was like, what the family was feeling back here, his two daughters, Miko, all these people that were being involved. And we as fans, we as viewers were, you know, experiencing it through his eyes on what was this series like? What was that experience like? So it's pretty exciting to be sitting next to you and actually get a chance to, you know, talk with a person that's been in space. So brother, thank you for making the time to uh, be here with us on Value Tamer. But my first question will be this for you. What made you wake up one day and say, I want to go to space? You know, as a kid growing up in the Apollo era, it's something that I was certainly interested in, um, like many kids were, you know, watching. When uh, Neil and Buzz and Mike Collins went to the moon, I was, uh, you know, I don't know, probably five, six years old. So that's one of my first memories of the space program, always interested in it, but I was uh, such a bad student. It was not something that I ever considered as a real possibility because couldn't do my homework. Really? Couldn't you couldn't do your homework? No. I know you talked somewhere about if you were today, you'd be considered an ADHD maybe. kid if you were a maybe. student today. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, but I, I can remember as a kid thinking this is absolutely impossible for me to pay attention. And, you know, being an astronaut was not something that I thought I could ever do, even though I was interested in it. I went to college, graduated from high school in the bottom half of my class, close to the middle, in the bottom. Went to college and was struggling there. Uh, again, possible, impossible for me to pay attention and study. I just didn't have that ability. And then one day I go into the college bookstore to buy gum or something, not a book. Mm -hmm wasn't a uh, big reader at the time at least uh, and I saw this book on the shelf that had a red white and blue cover and a really cool title made me pick it up I looked at the back looked through it took my gum money purchased the book laid there in my dorm room for the next few days and read the book the right stuff which was about the uh, test pilots in the military that became the uh, original Gemini Mercury and Apollo astronauts and maybe it was the way that Tom Wolfe wrote in this kind of creative nonfiction style or, you know, I think perhaps, uh, or I do think that the way he described these men, I felt like I had things in common with them in personality and risk taking. I just felt a connection to them with one big exception, and that is I was not a, a good student. And I thought, you know, if I can just fix that one thing about myself, well, maybe I can be a fighter pilot in the Navy or the Air Force, but I was more interested in the Navy because, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to land on the aircraft carrier. Maybe I could become a test pilot. Maybe I could become an astronaut someday, even. Oh, well, that book was my inspiration. It was my spark that got me to sort through my issues with education. Let me ask you this. When, when you look at in your space, because I wonder, I, you know, I went and did a research, I said, what percentage of kids grow up being astronauts? I asked him, he says, Pat, you have no idea. I want to be an astronaut when I grew up. I really don't. I said, how about you? He says, you know, I probably thought I'd want to be an astronaut, but I never thought I could be, right? And he followed everything you were doing on Instagram, you know, Twitter, all your things that you were mm -hmm. going back and forth. And you go today and you see astronaut on many different lists, Forbes, all this other stuff, 5%, 8%, 15%. And then you 15% see of what? Kids want to be astronauts. 5% oh, okay. yeah. of kids, different studies, right? They say, yeah. I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. There is this fascination with space, right? Mm -hmm. Something that we can't see. Having said that, and you said you came from the era, you were five, six years old, you know, Kennedy era, we're going to go land on the moon. And so there was like, I want to go also do that one day I grow up. And your brother, Mark, also same thing. He's also an astronaut, yeah. has twins, which is very random. This will be my question for you. From hanging out with other astronauts, and you said you read this book, and he talked about these different characters, Ford, and you said, I saw a similarity with me and them. What were some of the quality 
characteristic qualities you see that's common amongst the people that become astronauts? A big one is that they had done well in their previous career. So if you're a test pilot, you need to be a good test pilot. You need to do a good job. If you're a, a, a chemist or a scientist, you know, whatever field you're in, they're generally top performers in that field. But there are also people that have good uh, teamwork skills or good followers or good leaders. People that have other skills, you know, just because you might be the best physicist in the world doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be the best astronaut because the job has more requirements than just science. You know, you got to be a good wrench turner on mm. the space station. You have to, you know, be able to do spacewalks, robotics. You're the plumber, the electrician, the IT person, you know, all these kind of skills, the doctor, the dentist. You have to do everything. So, and I'm speaking in general terms, but people that are able to work well as part of a team and uh, do a lot of different things are, I think, uh, the common trait among most people in the astronaut office. How about personality-wise? How about person like, like, let me, maybe, let me ask you this way. What qualities are automatic no-goes? There's no way in the world you could be up there for 340 days if you can't handle this, this, this. What mm -hmm. would they be? People that aren't team players, uh, you know, people that can't take criticism. It's important to be able to have some self-awareness and know when you're doing something wrong mm -hmm. and readjust your behavior. Certainly, like, narcissists I don't think would do very well. So people in politics wouldn't do very well in, in space. You know, if they were like a narcissist, maybe they wouldn't, they wouldn't do, do, well. do well. Um, you know, how about claustrophobic? If, if somebody has issues with being and confined in one place, is that something where they say, you're a no-go, there's no way you could be up there? During the uh, astronaut selection process, they did a test on us and they hook you up with a heart monitor, put you in this rubber ball with a big thick zipper, and zip it closed and put you into a closet and leave you there. For how long, you said? They don't tell you. I think I was in there for about 20 minutes. They don't tell you. Yeah, so it's a test to see if you have claustrophobia. So you would never pass that test if you had claustrophobia. So we don't really have claustrophobic astronauts. You're up there for 340 days. Uh, when you went up there, for me, I mean, I look at, you got two different issues I'm thinking about, right? One of them is physical that you're talking about because when they did the testing, you come back and you were uh, one and a half, some say two inches, but I think you said it, it wasn't two inches, it was more one and a half inches, that I wasn't taller, I was more... Was a word you used stretched? I don't know what word you used. You know, gravity is pushing down on us right now. Right. So it compresses our spine. I would, and I need to do this myself just to, to confirm this in my own mind, but you measure yourself standing up, you go to sleep, you measure yourself lying in your bed, you're probably taller too because, you know, your spine has elongated. Stretch it. How yeah. much it does, I don't know. But, yeah, my spine elongated a little bit, and there was a big story that I grew two inches. There was a, there's a video when you landed and then your brother comes to hug you and he's standing right next to you. You could tell you're a little taller than your brother. And that little scene when you're watching, like, you know what? He looks a little taller than him. I don't know how much, but there's a little bit that you could possibly tell from the uh, yeah. viewer standpoint. So I, don't I know, could have had my not. platform shoes on. It could have been that you had your he high had heels flats. on. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so, okay. <laughs> so while, while you were up there, what was the, and again, not the 340 days because you've been before. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest thing you had to adjust adjust with the first time you went up? My first space flight? First space period, flight. Yeah. Which was seven days. It was on the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery in 1999. The biggest thing is just living in space. It's challenging. When everything floats, it makes most things harder to do, and it's a strange environment, and you have to deal with that. Um, you know, the challenge of working and living in that environment, and also how it makes you feel physically. It's not... Uh, the greatest feeling in the world where all of a sudden your blood has redistributed itself up in your body and now you have this like big-headed astronaut feeling that's not just about egos it's also about swelling head and uh, it's not comfortable and uh, that's the biggest adjustment you know on my first flight now you know subsequent flights especially when you're living on the space station I think the hardest part about it is is the the idea that if something bad happens to one of your family members, you can't come home. You are there, you know, it is an agreement you've made that, uh, you know, regardless of what happens on Earth, you have to stay there. You actually thought about that? 
Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. Let, let, when you were you're going through the process, I don't know what the preparation was for the 340. I, I read somewhere was six months, some number like that. A couple of years I trained. Oh, a couple of yeah. years they trained for that. Are there certain things that they prep you with and ask you questions with? Hey, Scott, you know, you need to keep this in mind. Are you okay with this? Do, was there a process you had to go through with them? You mean like from a, like a psychological standpoint? Yes. During the course of that two years of training, you have scheduled meetings with, I would call them the brain trust. This is a group of um, psychologists and psychologists. And they, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, how things are going, how's, uh, you know, what's your state of mind going into this? And then also, you know, ways to cope um, if you experience uh, challenges or difficulties or, you know, difficulties with, uh, you know, interpersonal relationships, whether they're in space or on the ground. And then when you get in, into space, you actually have a, a, a video conference with the same folks every two weeks to gauge how you're Every doing. two weeks. Every two weeks. How often are you in contact with your family, your friends? We have a, a, the ability to make phone calls on board. Uh, it's kind of like a, a you know, Skype audio only call. You can call people anywhere, basically anytime you have a satellite connection, which is probably about you know, 80% of the time. Uh, we do have some blackouts uh, periods where there's not good line of sight to the satellite. Uh, that people cannot call you, which in some ways is kind of nice. Um, because if you want to talk to somebody, you call them, and generally they answer the phone if it's from space. Um, <laughs> yeah, who's calling? It's from space, honey. Space. Pick it up. We'll yeah, we have email back. capability. We, they would have uh, regularly scheduled uh, video conferences on the weekend. So your ability to maintain a connection is, uh, is great on the space station. Now, going to Mars someday, it'll be different because... You know, after a few days, you're going to have such a time delay in the communication where the phone calls aren't going to work anymore. So then you're down to email and like a video recording mm. or recorded uh, messages. How, how did you keep yourself? Because did you? I'm assuming you have a lot of lag time, right? I mean, what do you... Very little free time. Very little free time. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? Are you... What work are you doing? You know, keeping the space station operating, uh, whether it's just the... Uh, the general uh, things you need to do to keep the systems running, uh, as an example, we, you know, we take our uh, our urine and we turn it into water by putting it into the system. So you know, every few days you're taking uh, urine from the Russian segment, you're putting it into our our system, you're uh, cleaning the filters, you're uh, inventorying certain you know hardware stuff that you might need, you're fixing things that have broken, you're doing scientific experiments, a lot of experiments. Uh, so it's a, uh, there's a lot of work. Um, I was never bored. I never found myself thinking, well, what am I going to do from a work perspective? There's always things that are just ready to go where you could, you could probably work, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you would still have okay. things to do. So you filtered urine and you drank the urine. No, we drank the water that was made from the urine. You drank the water that was made from the urine. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's a technical term, the way you're describing it, but was it Russians drinking American urine, the water aspect of it, and the Americans doing the opposite? Mostly, so our yeah. urine goes into our system right from the toilet. It's automatic. The yeah. Russian urine you had to bring from the Russian segment and, and uh, put it into our urine processor and water processing system. Um, and then, yeah, we mostly use that water there, it, but it's a barter system. Like we trade uh, things on the space station, <laughs> electricity, propulsion, uh, time, crew time. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of international agreements involved. So did you read a lot when you were up there? Um, I read some. This mission, my last mission, I, spent more time writing than I did reading, uh, mostly like a journal. To yourself, not to somebody else. Correct. Okay, got just it. Just like taking notes and got stuff, it. just trying to capture the whole experience, thinking that I might write a book someday. What's the, what's the closest thing to uh, uh, a movie you watch that you said, you know what, that's a, that's a pretty good you know, uh, explanation of what it is to be up there. Have you watched anything? He said, that kind of makes sense. I relate to that. You know, Apollo 13 is, was very well done. 
of course, that's not on the space station, but it is a good example of the, uh, you know, the type of people, the mm -hmm. mindset, kind of work we do, the risk involved. Martian's a good movie, too. You know, Gravity, I think they did a great job of, of rendering the space station, how it looks, mm -hmm. even though the physics of it was, you know, not accurate, but that's understandable. You know, you're trying to make an entertaining movie, so I had no problem with that. When I look at you in your videos, and you had this one video you were doing, what I think you had the two paddles, looks like ping pong paddles. I don't think they were ping pong paddles. It was two brown paddles that you had. And you're mm -hmm. doing the water thing up and that, which was kind of cool. And, you know, you kind of pull yourself and you go up. And I'm watching this saying, you know, in the world of weightlifting and exercising, the most important thing about developing muscle is pressure. Mm -hmm. If you don't have pressure to push something, your muscle is not going to develop. And if a person that's lift weights and trains and doesn't do that, yeah. muscle gets flabby, it gets soft, it gets weak. When, you, when, when the mission was over mm -hmm. and you came off, did you yourself feel like your muscles were weaker? Like, was there a moment where you were kind of starting to realize, I don't have the same strength as I had a year before me going on this? So we have uh, some very good exercise equipment on board, and we have to exercise at least two hours a day to prevent uh, not only your muscles from degrading, but also your bones. Two your, hours a day you exercise yes, every day? every day. So, you know, that includes time getting ready and time cleaning up. That's actually two and a half hours a day is, is the scheduled time. So, and what that exercise would consist of is um, aerobic exercise. And I would exercise six days a week. I needed like a mental rest day. Some people do it every day. I, I, that never quite worked for me. But the, we have a treadmill that you run on, you strap yourself, you have a harness that has bungee cords. And I would run um, usually about 35 minutes to 40 minutes. And then every other day I would do a bicycle, a stationary bicycle. Sometimes I would actually run more than I'd use the bicycle. But we also had a, uh, have a weightlifting machine that uses um, evacuated air cylinders to create the resistance. And it feels like real weight. I mean, it is an amazing machine. So you can do, you know, squats, deadlifts, heel raises, bench press, those. everything. Really? With, you know, you got to reconfigure it between exercises. But... Uh, yeah, you're doing, you know, squats with, uh, you know, hundreds of pounds, especially when you consider you no longer have body weight. That's, that's why I asked the question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. Because that whole perspective, you know, it makes sense if it's yeah. air. Because back in the days when I worked at Bally's, we had these machines called Kaiser machines, and they were all air. Mm -hmm. There was no weight. And that pressure was still a solid pressure. Yeah. That actually worked your muscle in a completely different way. You know, it feels, and when those, sometimes, I mean, the machines are generally very reliable, but there, there were cases where... You know, the, the weightlifting machine might be broken for a couple of days, mm -hmm. and it is not a good feeling. You, you actually feel like, oh man, you know, not opposing gravity or walking around is uh, definitely having a negative effect on your physiology that you could even feel it. Um, so, like, exercise is really, you really, uh, I think it's more enjoyable in space, actually, because your body needs it more in space. Wow, yeah. it's more enjoyable. Yeah. Interesting. What changed for you when it comes down to gravity or did anything change? Because a lot of questions, when I'm talking to you, like, you know, you're making it seem like it's very normal. And to, to some of us human beings that have never been to space before, to us, it's, we're very curious about mm -hmm. uh, what it was for you. What changed for you with the level of respect for gravity when you were up there for 340 days versus what it was before? Or was it, I already knew how gravity was nothing really changed much. My perspective wasn't different. You know, gravity is very helpful. Like people, I think a lot of people have this perception that if they could live in zero gravity their whole life, it would be great. You just float around and it's like peaceful. It actually makes just about everything harder to do. You know, imagine your house where you could never throw anything on the floor or on the counter. Uh, everything always has to be put away or secured. Things are really easy to lose. Um, it affects how you feel physically. So on one hand, it's sort of fun to float and you can flip around and you can move around places quickly. Uh, it's also uh, not a great feeling when you're living, you know, for months with this fluid shift in your head that never completely goes away. So, you know, there's a downside to it. So. I am very happy living with gravity. You are very happy living with gravity. I love gravity. Your, your experience being up there, you were up there with Misha, right? Who was the, the Russian, Mikhail, Misha, 
who was the Russian uh, astronaut who went up there with you. And now, cosmonaut, yeah. Yes, and so when, when, you're, when you're up there and you're, you, know, you have a partner that's representing a nation that at one point was an enemy, even maybe today could be viewed as an enemy if you turn on CNN, Fox, or mm -hmm. uh, MSNBC. And I'm not going on the political side here with you. My question for you would be, did, did you guys have a lot of opportunity to just sit there and talk uh, and collaborate and see different views and actually appreciate the differences and, and say, look, I mean, I, I can't believe I'm here. You're representing an enemy to our country at some point, and I'm over here from you know, America, and we actually are building a friendship together. How was that relationship like, relationship like with you and Misha? So I've known him and a lot of the other cosmonauts for a long time. I think I probably first met Misha in the uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, the same with many of the other cosmonauts I had been in space with. And when you're in space with whether it's a Russian or a Japanese guy or someone from a European country or your fellow you know, American crew member, you realize that the most important thing to you as a group is each other and your collective safety and uh, you know, helping and supporting one another. In an, in an environment that's very, very challenging. So that is that relationship is much more important to the folks in space than the relationship maybe between our, our two nations. There are times when we would talk politics a little bit. This last time I was in space was when, uh, you know, the Russian military went into Syria. And we talked about it a little bit, and I think I just said basically, hey, I hope you guys can help with this or figure this out. But it would never become something that would, I think, get between us because really we do rely, uh, you know, literally on each other for our lives, and that's what's most important. I mean, you are a nation when you're up there, right? I mean, realistically, he may be Russian or American, yeah. but you are in your own country yeah. in space. So that's, yeah. a, that's an interesting, I never thought about it that when yeah. you explain it that way, regarding Mars. So... When do you think that that experience is actually going to become a reality? No idea. When I was on the space station this last time, I was asked a question by a, uh, by a reporter. And the question was, you know, now that NASA has determined that some time of the year there is liquid water on Mars, will that help us get there any sooner? And I said, I don't know, maybe. Now if we found money on Mars, that would help us get there because that's what we need is money. We need money to go to Mars. So someone's got to start a propaganda saying there's these gold mines that we got to go get. Next yeah, thing you know, a million great? people live there. Maybe. The Oklahoma land rush, similar yeah. to it. Let's just... Okay. Yeah. So, by, by the way, how much... Your brother once said... It's less, it's, less it's, about... It's less uh, about rocket science, science than and more about, about political science. science. I, I thought it was Absolutely. fascinating when your brother said, what is the dollar amount? What is the dollar amount if we did want to go there? Would you have any idea or not really? I would be guessing, but I would say somewhere between... A hundred and two hundred billion dollars. A hundred to two hundred billion. Maybe I don't know. Oh wow! So that's 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 real money if we wanted to go. So that so ain't chump change. That ain't chump change. But maybe here's a question. I'd be curious to know what you would say about it. Should we want to? You know, we've always by nature we're explorers, especially yeah. America and just human beings. We kind of yeah. want to go explore. Even when we're kids, we're like, I want to know what's in that room that mommy and daddy won't let me go into. There's a certain part of us that yearns for that. Mm. Do you think it's important for us to really? go in the direction of coming together as a nation or coming together um, you know, as different nations and saying, look, let's put our money together and figure out a way to go see what's on Mars. I, I think so. I think uh, you know, not, not only is it a, a goal that we can work on together, it's this international partnership, we can do it in an uh, area that is a common ground to all of us. I think there is uh, you know, financial reasons to do it. I think doing the, the hardest things uh, technologically causes us to have to develop new uh, industries and mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. and that have uh, benefits um, that are you know separate than going to Mars will have benefits for us here on Earth I think that um, like you said we are explorers history will tell us that you know civilizations that have stopped expanding and exploring have ceased to exist so you know at some point on this Earth we are going to have to continue to venture out into um, our solar system if we want to continue to grow and survive. I'm not saying we need to turn Mars into another Earth, mm -hmm. but I think it is important for the continued survival of this planet to be able to grow beyond 
the planet because you know we have an increasing population and there are uh, many reasons to do this and if you said you know everything I said is not right I think maybe not the investment it would take to go to Mars but certainly a uh, the investment we currently have like in our space program the billions of dollars we spend every year if you didn't think that money was worth it, we shouldn't be going into space for the reasons we do. If the only thing we got out of it is kids in this country could say, hey, I'm going to do my math and science homework because I want to work for NASA someday, that pays for itself. Because, you know, I go around to schools and kids are excited about the space program. It makes them be better students. It makes some of them become uh, scientists and engineers. And these are the jobs that create things which fuel our economy. I think, I think your story definitely, if there's a kid out there that's watching and that series that timed it, if, by the way, if you haven't seen it, I suggest you go on time, type in uh, uh, Scott Kelly in time and it'll go from one, two, three, I think it's 12 episodes. I don't know the exact, yeah, I, I think it's 12, I think it's 12 episodes, the entire experience from the beginning to the end. Uh, uh, so, you, you and know. And it won an Emmy. It won an Emmy, that's right, I saw that, it won an Emmy and I think 2015 you were recognized top 100 most influential people according to Time Magazine, right? I think it was 2015. Yeah, so, you know, in, in, in sports, there are fans who have opinions about basketball, then there are basketball players who have opinions about basketball. Meaning, if Kobe Bryant gives, you know, critiques, let's just say a basketball player, that's different than you and I, a fan saying, I think such and such is doing their part right, right? Or in baseball, you're an Astros fan, if Jeff Bagwell tells Mike Trout uh, a certain thing that he needs to pay attention to, maybe Trout's going to take more feedback from a Bagwell than maybe you and I are giving it to him, right? Mm -hmm. So when you landed, your brother Mark, he's also an astronaut, what was the conversation like with him that was so different than everybody else in the world that kind of has no clue what they're talking about? What was that conversation with somebody that actually speaks to your language where you appreciated that conversation versus everyone else? Well, you know, it's it's great to have a, a sibling that has a similar experience. Now, my brother had never done a long duration flight, but just talking to him about, especially like flying the space shuttle, because we had both done that, and then, you know, sharing with him what it's like on the Soyuz or do the spacewalk is a real privilege. I, you know, it's a privilege to be able to fly in space, and then it's really, you know, a privilege really only my brother and I have where you can share this kind of experience with a sibling. A couple of cosmonauts, their dads were, were cosmonauts too. Um, but, you know, Mark and I having the ability to talk about something that is so incredible that we both got to do is, uh, you know, one of the great privileges of my life, actually. I, I don't know if it gets better than that, by the way. And, and, and I wonder how your parents think, you know, when they see... Oh, they were very proud of Mark and I, yeah. I mean, what else can their kids do to make their parents proud? If you got both of them go up there, I mean, that's a resume mm -hmm. check. My grandmother, my uh, maternal grandmother, when she was alive, had a had a bumper sticker on her car that said, "My two my two twin grandsons are astronauts," <laughs> and I'm sure people threw like eggs, eggs at her. Eggs at them, yeah. No, they really Crazy are. Lady. It's you know Mark and Kelly, Scott Kelly. Yeah. So okay, if somebody's watching right now, and you know a ten year old, a twelve year old, a fourteen year old, somebody that's fascinated with space. What books, if you were to recommend two or three books, obviously that one book you recommended earlier, what books would you recommend for someone to read that either, that's going to be one we're going to get to to wrap up here because it's, <laughs> this will be the last one. By the way, if you haven't seen this book, I'm going to do some, he's going to do some sign and we'll do some giveaways. So hang tight for that one. But what other books would you recommend for people to consider getting that, uh, you know, maybe inspired you as you were coming up? Mike Collins' book, Carrying the Fire, is uh, one of the best astronaut autobiographies uh, there is. The book that inspired From the Earth to the Moon by a Andrew Chaikin, I forget the name of it, but it was uh, basically, you know, the history of the Apollo program. And, you know, The Right Stuff is a book that inspired me. The Right Stuff isn't just about spaceflight, though. It's, it's also about, you know, being a test pilot in the military mm. and, and working in the military. But you know, my inspiration was, was the right stuff, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, p most people will agree Carrying the Fire is, uh, you know, probably the best astronaut autobiography. So here's what we're going to be doing. First of all, um, to tell you that I myself am grateful that somebody like you is willing to 
sacrifice your life with two kids. You got two kids and you're willing to make a decision to mm -hmm. go up there for 340 days so we mm -hmm. can become smarter as a nation to uh, mm -hmm. uh, do better the next time we got, are we really prepared to go to Mars? And you put your life on the line and your family sat down and had those conversations which I want you to know as a you know person who was in the military before, that's uh, the highest level for you to be willing to do that. So thank you for your service. But here's what I want to do for those of you out there that are big, uh, Scott Kelly fans. I know many of you said, Pat, I, I would love to see him on Value Tainment. I said, no problem. So here's what we're doing. We got some books here, and if you can talk about this book that you wrote, Endurance. We got this book here that Scott wrote, Endurance, A Year in Space, A Lifetime of Discovery. Um, for those of you that are truly Scott fans, I'm not talking about somebody that would love to have this book because you want to have it signed and put it on the bookshelf and you're not going to go through it. I want people that actually followed his material when he was up there. Maybe you were on Twitter that day when he was doing questions and Barack Obama came up and said, what is it like to be up there? And then uh, uh, who was uh, the, the, the astronaut that came back and tweeted? And I he, forget. He, yeah, so, you know, when, when, you, when you went through, if you, were, if, you're, if you were following that entire experience, I want you to tweet him and tweet me and tell me why you were following his story. Maybe you're the biggest fan of what he was doing. And we'll pick four winners and we'll send four copies, signed copies to four different people. But you got to tweet it out. So tweet him and put me in the handle. We'll pick four winners and we'll send a signed copy to four of you uh, of the book Endurance, written by the one and only uh, Scott Kelly. Is there anything you want to say about your book before we finish off the interview here? Um, you know, it's a book about uh, spending a year in space, certainly. But it's also a book about this kid who couldn't do his homework that figured his stuff out and then later spent a year in space uh, and did some pretty uh, interesting things in between. Slightly, slightly interesting things. I mean, that's to say the least. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Appreciate you. My pleasure.